Okay, that was more of an East Coast sort of a thing. Um, rabies, pox virus is probably out of all those the, the most important because I think that it's a common cutaneous injury. Um, often people get it by, from bite wounds. We see it in the skin, but we also, there's some papers and examples of it in the oral mucosa as well. And it's just kind of your classic thing that appears, you know, um, 10 to 20 days after the exposure. And really, antibiotics aren't going to do any good, as you know, because it's a virus. And then there was one definitive paper where they actually sequenced the, the, the DNA out of the seal's mouth and out of the veterinary technician's hand that kind of showed this. Um, lots of different bacteria. And I'm going to turn it over to Marty to talk about lepto. Thanks, man. So I um, just asked to speak, uh, speak a little bit about leptospirosis and uh, just because it seems to generate a lot of interest from the, the human side of things. Um, lepto is one of my very favorite type of diseases. It's a perfect illustration of a enzootic with periodic epizootic. So um, in California sea lands, especially through California, hence the name, every five to seven years is a large epidemic zootic in our case, um, of, of clinical disease, animals dying, renal failure is the primary cause of death. Serovar that we talk about is Pomona in these guys for the most part. Gripotyphosa is a little bit secondary, and that's a little bit different than our, our dogs and uh, that we're used to, Ectrohomagica is, is, is the serovar we deal with there. The um, animals get exposed, antibodies are built, long-lived animals, they have antibodies um, for a long period of time. Up around here where we get mostly adult animals, it would be really, really weird to have a seronegative animal. That would be really scary actually, so <clears throat> don't about, sorry, um, don't be alarmed about seropositive um, adult uh, pinnipeds, especially California sea lions, um, around here, they're probably not a likely source of shedding. They're not an active disease, not usually anyway. This is how we present, or how we get, uh, our, excuse me, how the animals present to us. Um, typically, um, two to three-year-old animals, sub-adults, kind of at the top end of the range. So young animals, they don't have the protective animals. Um, herd uh, immunity has decreased over time as antibodies drift away. Young animals are exposed, their susceptible outbreak happens. That makes sense, right? And then animals that survive have antibodies, they're protected, they keep going. Young animals are protected by mat uh, maternal antibodies typically, so again, it's that two to four year age of, uh, range of animals. Typically, mostly in California, that's where those animals hang out. So what we see is an uh, animal that drinks uh, fresh water. They're very, very thirsty, really, really dehydrated. Classic acute renal failure based on clinical chemistry, um, fluids, um, the antibiotics you'd expect for leptospirosis work. Um, they tend to um, work very well, so you can get an animal through that. Um, on occasion, we have uh, uh, animals that are a little bit more persistent in their infections, so we go to a secondary round of, uh, of antibiotics. This is the case here, and I won't dwell on it because we have a lot of things to do in about three, four minutes, and I can talk really fast, but not that fast. So. Um, that's this animal, um, so it went, uh, went through a second round just for fun. We can do high-tech things like laparoscopic guided biopsy just to make sure it was a primary renal failure that we're still dealing with and not, uh, not something else, and that it was, in fact, leptospirosis that we were dealing with and that the animal could come back from that. So uh, here we go. Um, everything's consistent. So just a kind of one case uh, of, of that kind of thing just to show you that we actually do medicine every now and then. And back to, back to Joe, much slower. You have your own mic. Oh, uh, I'm always trying to get the mic from Marty. Um, okay, so this is one also, just going into a little bit of detail, uh, seal finger is reported, uh, basically it's usually a cutaneous lesion on the hand, hence the name uh, seal finger. And the important thing about seal finger is that there are a couple different etiologies that can cause this. I think uh, mycoplasma is probably the most common one. And then the other one that we see is erysipelothrix. And the reason that that's important to understand that there's two etiologies that can cause the same issue is when you're trying to treat these things. So a lot of times people want to treat something with a cephalosporin and then it's not getting better and the doctor says, well, I don't know why it's getting better because I'm treating with uh, what I think of as erysipelothrix, but maybe it's, it's uh, mycoplasma and so it's not going to get better. So being able to understand what some of the etiologies can be and being, being able to be a biologist or be a veterinarian, or be in the public health room and be able to educate the, your own physician is really important. Um, this was a case that happened 
There's a seal in San Juan Island that hangs out around the fishing dock. It has one eye. It's a female, but she's named Popeye. She comes back with a pup every year. People love this. A guy made a whole business out of selling five herring for $5 that you could feed her. And, um, and then we got a call in July that it jumped up and bit this guy's arm. I think he was hanging it over the side of the boat. Maybe she was looking through the bad eye, thought it was a salmon or something, up, but jumped up and bit this guy's arm. And, um, and then they, they called and said, hey, anything this guy should worry about? And, um, and so then we talked with this person and said, hey, there's a, actually a couple different things that could be going on. You may not get any of them. And turned out that he had already um, spoken with his physician and she put him on uh, two different drugs here. And Marty was just talking about this and said actually the um, levofloxacin probably would have been adequate for both of them because of the spectrum, uh, broad spectrum nature of that. Get the mycoplasma as well. Um, and we'll go into some fungal infections. We, we, these are usually, people get fungal infections associated with marine mammals because they get a bite or they stick their hand down an animal's throat and get their uh, teeth and get introduction that way. But I'm gonna let Marty talk about one that we uh, do see in this area. Uh, not kind of a classic uh, zoonosis, but something to, that we'd be remiss not to bring up. Awesome disease here too. So. Um, Cryptococcus um, gadi, uh, that's a disease that, you know, when we're studying, studying for board exams, doing zoo work, we associate with koalas. And we associate with koalas in, in, uh, in what's that little island, Australia? And, uh, and, and with eucalyptus, right? Eucalyptus is, is kind of the, the reservoir for Cryptococcus. It gets into animals, people. It's a terrestrial disease. Well, about 2000 or the year 2000, we started seeing cases crop up in marine mammals alongside of cases cropping up in people, and it kills people dead. So it's immunocompetent people going out for strolls in the woods, uh, bringing in the spores and dying, typically of two syndromes, either pulmonary or a neurologic uh, syndrome. In marine mammals, it's a little bit different. Um, we get mostly pulmonary forms. Um, the marine mammals that are affected, a lot of cetacean species affected, harbor porpoise, number one, but a number of other animals as well. Um, we just put out a few uh, cases on, on harbor seals. So, so it's cross species, marine. So how that organism that we normally associate with Australia, okay, eucalyptus, that got brought to California, that makes sense. And then a terrestrial people walk in redwoods, maybe, you know, there's, uh, or not redwoods, but coastal cedar, there's, so there might be some transmission. With, but how to get into the marine environment, that's, that's an incredibly interesting question. And is the marine environment now a reservoir back? Um, so that's the other big question. So pulmonary um, form is the, number, is the number one form that we see in marine mammals. Um, typical lymphadenopathy, um, widespread, devastating, um, severe, uh, multisystemic mycosis. Um, their uh, harbor seals, excuse me, harbor porpoise that we get to the aquarium, normally young animals, but every now and then uh, we get uh, something older than a calf. Um, this is uh, Theo, who was just, very odd looking animal. Um, we couldn't diagnose what was going on with him at all. Uh, our chemistries or you know, basic blood work, ultrasounds, x-rays, nothing was really coming up on him. Uh, he did display neurologic behavior, head, head pressing, so he, he'd want to swim. He was not a very good swimmer, he had to be supported, but he did want to swim into the side of a pool and kind of press his head, that was one sign. Kind of waxed and waned a little bit. Um, and then uh, the shanty factor, as I call it, was brought into effect. This is one of our veterinary technicians, and she likes to keep me in line. And shanty goes, you're not doing anything for this animal. This animal's getting worse. What are you going to do? So, um, so we uh, went, well, we've kind of tried everything we can at our place, so let's try one of these. Uh, so we went ahead and did uh, an MRI on, on Theo. Interestingly enough, we did find an abscess in the cerebrum. Um, a slightly dilated ventricle as well, um, or at least a, a lesion. Um, that was enough to euthanize the animal because um, we weren't going to be coming back from that and it was an animal that was in decline. So at least we'd found a reason for that, which is often uh, when we're dealing with stranded animals, it's, it's finding a good reason to make a really good choice for an animal as soon as possible. That's always kind of our goal. So uh, we did make that choice and euthanized him. Um, brought him over, and it was cryptococcus, and it was a neurologic form, which is um, very strange for us. They, they, they doesn't act like that in, in marine mammals, so that was a, a big eye opener for me on, on, on cases that aren't being aren't responding the way I should, and, and maybe getting a little bit more involved in our diagnostics. But again, this is a disease that kills people dead. 
It's, um, there's uh, some testing that we went through that, that opened our eyes a little bit because we, we did look for it early on, but our, our testing was negative. When we got a little bit more specific um, with some of the human um, available tests, we got positives in, in hindsight. So that was good to know as well. Um, and then uh, just uh, the conclusions that I've been blabbing up, uh, about. But um, yeah, the diseases that kill um, both humans and, and animals uh, in our shared environment, kind of important stuff. Keep, keep your mic. Um, okay, so basically the question, should you be concerned that we brought up, and I think the answer is yes, you should be concerned. Should you panic? Um, no, don't panic. Um, take home messages are pretty clear that basically there are real risks that are out there. We're, we're continually learning more about those, so uh, it's important to stay educated about that. And that you really need to be the one, the, if you're a biologist, if you're a veterinarian, um, or if you know of a friend, you have to educate your physicians. You have to let them know what the possibilities are and have them look into that. And then and basically it's just a lot of uh, public health common sense. Don't eat or drink when you're working with them. Wear gloves. Wash your hands. Hold hands when you're crossing the street. Don't run with scissors. Things like that. Um, and then, you know, it's always a good idea to wear gloves. Thanks, Marty, for that one. Yeah, okay. Um, and just wanted to say thanks to you guys for having us up. Uh, Marty wants to thank a lot of people. Um, I don't really, I just want to thank Marty. And if you guys have any thanks questions, we're happy to answer. Any questions? Thank you, guys. I think she meant thank you, us. You can ask questions. <laughs> I wanted to ask about the lepto. How do they get infected? Oh, super good question. So it is not an organism that likes salt water. Um, salt water kills leptos, uh, leptos very nicely. So how do the animals get infected? Um, there is some association with El Nino years. So um, the, the thought is that there are some persistent shedders. They shed into um, tide pools that are now becoming less and less um, salt water, but more fresh water or, or newly created pools. The young animals like to play in that. They're introduced and outbreak goes. Um, but it, essentially, the only shedding is in the urine. So, it, so it, somehow they're drinking each other's urine. How they originally got it, I don't know. Um, and what, you know what I mean, they're not actually drinking urine, but they're urine contaminated sickos over there. Cooper, Maria. Um, anyway, so, um, so freshwater runoff was thought um, as, a, as an original um, cause. Pomona is a, is a disease of agricultural concern, so, so that long ago that was thought to be the, the, the originating source. This might be a long-standing marine adapted disease though as well. Anyone else? Oh, maybe I'll just walk real slow, Aaron. <laughs> Thanks for that great presentation. So a few weeks ago, I emailed you about that um, media post in Oregon about warning pet owners to be mindful of uh, their pets contacting seals because of this leptospirosis outbreak. Is that something, did that, I'm just curious on your additional thoughts on, on that. Were cases seen in the past in other pets that have been associated with marine mammals? I don't feel definitively no. And again, the serovar is a little bit different. Um, it's not to say it's not transmissible. And certainly animals, uh, you know, our domestic species and people have come up with Pomona. And, and you know, like the, the taxonomy of leptospirosis is all really weird too. And we, Serovars is kind of an older term, but some of us old guys still like to use that kind of stuff, whereas you know, the speciation stuff is a little bit different. But um, not directly. Um, I gotta admit, it often is used as a disease to help us tell people to keep away from animals. So it might not be 100% truthful, but um, it's nice to, to use it. And, and honestly, harbor seals, do come up with it. Um, it's a lot more rare to see uh, a harbor seal with, with leptospirosis. Then it's more gripotyphosa typically in, in harbor seals. But anyway, a long-winded answer, sorry. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? We've, uh, we've run out of time. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs>